All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, 2024 Sprint Masters uh, Seminars. Today, our speaker is Dr. Liu He um, is uh, an, our uh, faculty at track. He specifically emphasized that he's his, in his lab all the time working, so many of people don't do not know him. Joking. <laughs> We've been here at track for a very long time. Uh, so Dr. Fer um, did his mas uh, bachelor's master's at Seoul International uh, University and joined uh, Virginia Tech, obtained his PhD in 2011, uh, working on uh, biological system engineering. Uh, he joined the track uh, in 2016, um, working all his way up to be a associate professor. Congratulations. Last year, um, and his expertise is in hydrology modeling and monitoring, and his current project is involves uh, 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 the best uh, management practices uh, to uh, measure the uh, sustainability in climate change. Okay, that's so, uh, just for the record, this uh, uh, seminar is being recorded, and, and for those people on uh, uh, join online. If you have questions, please tap them in the chat box or uh, we will read it for you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for coming. And again, I'm, I'm Young Hu. And uh, I decided to give a talk about the, my research because I'm already hiding and playing with the computer in my office. And, uh, <laughs> Some of you may not know what I'm doing, so I just want to <laughs> show off the what we, we, we what we have done and uh, and uh, that we are finding from our research project. So okay, so I just want to give us some some a little bit of background here. So here is southwest uh, southeast Florida, almost five million people living in ten miles from shoreline. <clears throat> And then uh, almost 300 million people uh, living in the, the areas lower than five meters from the mean sea level. And then our landscape is a, so so flat, and the average slope, landscape slope is 0.25%. And as you can see here, the many people are leaving the coastal areas, and we are getting the more people coming, and uh, here, the very south of the, the Miami County is almost uh, in the underwater, and we have uh, some depressional areas along the coastline here. And our aquifer, Biscayan aquifer, is, is very shallow and very permeable. So salt water can easily intrude into our aquifer. And then the our, I mean the salinity level of our Groundwater resource may increase. And then groundwater level also rise because of the sea level rise. So <laughs> our groundwater resources are vulnerable to large storm events like hurricane. And within the, a day, 24 hours after hurricane or a big storm event, groundwater le level may rise by one feet or more than one feet. And then we have uh, two, two issues here, right? The salt water intrusion and groundwater flooding. This is a profile of our aquifer. And uh, we have a salt water under the sea and we have fresh water. Uh, we have an uh, interface uh, between the fresh water and salt water. We have a breakage water here. And <clears throat> if sea level rise this much, and then salt water or sea water is pushing the, the we call the variable density flow to the to the fresh water aquifer, and then this interface may move to in, in, inland, right? And then if you keep taking water from the aquifer, it's going to accelerate the salt water into the processes. And the only way to slow or slow the salt water salt water into the process is uh, increasing the fresh water in our aquifer. And then we can push back to the, the, the interface to the to the sea. To do this, we need to we need to have a more water infiltrate and uh, percolate it into aquifer. And then the problem is we have 
is biological, where the unsaturated soil profile here, and it's kind of a sponge, it's a, like a buffer. So it can hold, it can temporarily hold the, the rainwater, especially in the community, the hurricane or storm event. So it's gonna help us, uh, it'll help to prevent the flooding or especially ground of flooding. But if you have a sea rise increase this much, we are going to lose our buffer this much. Though. So we may have groundwater flooding or surface water flooding more frequently in the future because of the, the sea, level, sea level rise. So we have a two different issues, right? So the, this is a, the, how can I say it? So again, buffer we call the, the unsaturated zone reduced this much because of the sea level. And then, uh, landscape or the landscape or slope of of area also also matters because let's say we have a four different slope right is this a one to one and one to eight this is maybe somewhere in northwest where let's say this is a uh, is the southeast Florida right we, we our landscape is so flat and I'm the slope is very shallow and then let's say we have a Sea level increase this much one unit, one, one meter and one foot, right? And then in this case, on the ground surface, salt water may introduce just one unit, right? One one foot or one meter. But in our case, because slope is so shallow, one meter increase means eight meters. So I mean salt water intrusion on the ground, right? As I mentioned earlier, the our average slope is. 0.25%, which means 0.5 meter increase, I mean, sea level increase, it means 200 meter or feet inland intrusion of salt water on the underground surface. I'm talking about surface, right, on the surface. And sea level rise has uh, the implication in urban stormwater management too. This is a profile of, let's say, the Miami Dade, right? Miami Dade County or the Magic City. And uh, this is a stormwater collection system or a drainage networks we have in the urban areas. And because, again, the slope is so shallow, let's say we, have a, we had a storm event two days ago, right? And then water is collected and then drained through the, this this drainage system, but the, the speed is so slow because slope is shallow, right? So slowly draining, right? And then let's say we have a high tide level here. It's a simple hydraulic, right? And then some of the stormwater will be stuck in in this drainage system. For example, king tide, right? <laughs> let's say we have a higher tide level. And then we have some depression areas along the coastal line. And then the more water or more stone water will be stuck in in this drainage system and it's coming out through the, the outlet. And then this area will be flooded. If we have a sea rise here much, additional coastal area will be flooded because of stone event and the sea rise. I just want to show this case. 2017, October 7th, I believe it's a Saturday, and I heard that we are going to have a king tide. And in the morning, I just ventured out to find any evidence. And then, I, I fortunately, I found this one. It's a North, North Miami somewhere. And then I, I mean, there are some people from the FIU doing, doing something already. And then I decided to fly the drone and to take a video and see the, the spatial extent of the flooding. I was not good at the driving drone at this moment because I just bought it <laughs> that time. Anyway, so there is a fire station. It's two days ago of this sunny day, we had a big rain event, but uh, this area is still under flooding. It's about a mile from the shoreline, less than a mile. And then it's hard to see the sky, but it's, uh, it's clear. 
It's moving. <clears throat> But it is hard to see the I could see the water is coming out of the the drainage system because of the presses, right? But anyway, so the Okay, and uh, there is also agricultural implications of, of city rise. And some of the plants, and maybe many of the plants, are sensitive to selling from irrigation water selling. Right? And then the high salinity level may limit plant growth yeah. and <clears throat> subsequently the reduce crop yield. And then another problem is salt may be accumulated in soil. And then later, it's, it's more difficult to wash out all the salt with the fresh water. And then, if you take a more fresh water to wash out salt, it's, it's, it's accelerate or promote the salt water intrusion again because we are we are taking the fresh water out of the aquifer, right? It's, it's a vicious cycle, right? So, for example, let's say we have a salt water intrusion this much, taking too much water for irrigation and it's gonna damage the, the plants and crops and salt to be accumulated. So we need to be careful. So we may want to relocate the, the pumping wells and uh, reduce the pumping rate. So <coughs> uh, we need to we need to know the how much we or which areas, how 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 large area will be affected by salt water intrusion and uh, how much the, I mean, irrigation water salinity may increase in the future, right? So, but uh, at this moment, uh, at that moment, we didn't know that. And then we just, uh, we, we, we conducted uh, one field experiment with, with here, Bruce, and uh, to see how our crops, especially the, the ornamental crop, may respond to the increased salinity level in the irrigation water. So, we selected the two different types of ornamental crops in the hibiscus and mandavilla. And then the poster farms provided, uh, kindly for, provided all the, all the samples and uh, we went there and uh, took a soil, uh, took a water sample from, uh, from there, the irrigation, I mean the, the irrigation water system. And then we found that the salinity level of the dead water is about 0.5 decimal per meter. This is, completely normal and it's fresh, right? And then we take this as a control and uh, we increase the center level to one, 1.5, two, four, seven, and 10. And this hay viscous and mandavilla, right? And then what you wanna see how the, the these ornamental crops react to the increased level of salinity. And uh, NDVI is uh, one of the the popular tool to monitor and measure the biomass and uh, checking the, the plant growth. And uh, there are many regulations for the use of drone. And then I do not want to take a test to, to fly drone and uh, I just uh, come up with the, the uh, un, inexpensive plan. So I just uh, bought a scaffold from the Home Depot and uh, two to wood stick and I just attach the sensors to the, to the top of the this this uh, wood stick and the two and then just took a, a picture every day and uh, nine noon and three p.m. to to monitor the temporal variation or the growth of the the these uh, one of the crops mm -hmm. and then this example this uh, post infrared and this is a calculated NDVI. You can see the, the NDVI value vary depending on the the part of the part of the plants and uh, the and the by location. So we have a whole different uh, whole different salinity 
levels, and uh, we have a four leaf case per, per treatment. And then this is summary. And SSC is salinity level from normal 0.5 to the 10, and y axis is uh, above ground biomass. So this is the heat viscous and Amanda Villa case. And 0.5 is normal, is is a step, is a control, right? Whenever we increase the, the salinity level up to one, the biomass quickly drop. And then uh, in the further increasing the the salinity level, the biomass does not change much. And then when the salinity level reaches the four point zero, and then it just quickly drops again. And Mandavilla. Mandavilla also a little bit uh, decrease at the beginning and then they quickly decrease when the salinity level is greater than 4.0. And growth rate and the container. I do not want to go to the detail. So conclusions and current level of salinity 0.5 SC name per meter is, is the same. I mean, it's, uh, now it's the same for both ornamental crops. And uh, he discussed was found more tolerant to high salinity, I mean, relatively right? more tolerant than Mendavilla. And uh, plant growth was significantly affected or limited when the salinity level reached the uh, increase to 7.0 or greater than that. And uh, there is a USDA, a USGS report saying that there are uh, USGS monitoring the salinity level along the coastline. There are several the monitoring points, uh, one of the points close to the hours. I mean, the fact that they reported that the highest concentration was 9.12 decimal per is much higher than 7 or 4, right? So, but still, we don't know the, how the our aquifer or the our location so the salinity level change in the future because uh, salt water may intrude this much, I mean, to the trail, or it can be just stay there the, on the on the on the shoreline, right? So, so we decided to do some kind of a modeling study. Uh, before that. Uh, the, our question is uh, how many, how may the groundwater elevation and salt water intrusion uh, change in the future, right? So this is another study I did with Katie and Bruce a long time ago. And uh, for example, I mean the root, root system of crops or plants are sensitive to the soil moisture, right? Or the groundwater flooding. For example, tomato, if uh, the Tomato has a root system of a tomato has a high I and mean, excess soil moisture longer than one day, and there is I mean this root system will be damaged by water, right? It, it may be rotten or you have some 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 I mean the some bad bacteria is going to affect uh, the the tomato growth. And avocado it has a uh, deeper root of gas up to the sixty one centimeter. Tomato is eighteen centimeter, right? So we, we simulate here the groundwater level using model developed by USGS. See, see how, how can I say, how the, our groundwater level responded to the rainfall event. For example, let's say we assume the 3.5, 5.1 centimeter within a day, right? 7.6 centimeter rain, and then we could map out the risk or the areas that may have a higher risk of being flooded. I mean, not flooding here, flooding means not surface flooding, okay? It's groundwater flooding or excess soil water. <clears throat> because uh, avocado has a uh, deeper root depth compared, I mean, uh, compared to the green bean tomato. As you can see, black means high, high root zone saturation risk, right? I mean, the Avocado is a dry season, the wet season. The, we have a more, I mean, the areas they may have higher or excess soil water in the future for the for the avocado. But in tomato, we have less. So this is just an example how the modeling approach can help us understand that what's going to happen. We have a 
different scenarios and works, different things in, uh, happens in the future. So our question is, again, how much may groundwater elevation rise in the future, right? How much may saltwater intrude in the, I mean, the, to the aquifer in the future, right? So there are many different factors affecting the, these two, two groundwater, I mean, the characteristics, right? For example, the groundwater, I mean, sea level rise is one of the things, the climate change, because it's gonna change the precipitation or weather patterns, air temperature, air temperature, the effect or the evaporation and uh, also water management practices. Like uh, lots of water is, is discharged from the lake of Shobi to the base of the <coughs> system we have, and every day is national power wants to have more water to maintain their the biodiversity in the ecosystem. And uh, and the South Florida Water Management District and the USAC doing their their job to and, and with the clean operation like uh, maintaining and uh, changing the, the lake water level and changing the flow of, of the canal work. So, so we, we need to consider all these things to make uh, our prediction reliable. And uh, we found it may take a lot of time for us to develop a new model. And then we just decided to directly adopt the, the model already developed by USGS. <clears throat> Unfortunately, USGS <laughs> made the model, uh, which is called the UMD model, in 2016. And uh, they spent four years to calibrate this model to the field observations, including the wall, uh, including the, the groundwater levels, observed at the wells, and then the USGS kindly provided this model to us. So, and uh, Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact is, is, is big name. And, and the, they are updating future civil rights scenarios. And then the latest one was uh, updated in 2019. And there are many different uh, civil rights projections by the agencies and by scenarios. For example, uh, this, this group uh, included uh, these four serialized scenarios in, in their, in their uh, document or recommendation. For example, no ice cream is a worst case scenario, right? It's going to increase a lot in the future. And uh, more conservative and more, how can I say, liberal or optimistic scenarios, IPCC is medium, and then, the, the Miami-Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County, and Monroe County are following, are uh, using these scenarios for their infrastructure infrastructure planning and design. So for example, between low and intermediate high, the IPCC median, these projections are recommended to, to designing the infrastructure who has a 50 year lifespan, for example, right? If lifespan is goes up, we need to take a more conservative scenario or assumptions. Anyway, so we decided to take a this three because it's, it looks too high, and uh, and uh, oh, many studies is taking these three scenarios. And another factor is climate climate change, and uh, again the precipitation and air temperature affect the. Uh, the, or control the hydrological cycle, eventually the groundwater retards and the, everything. Climate projections. There are many different scenarios depending on the, how the assumptions, how human society reacted to the, the change in, in climate in the future, right? So more liberal or optimistic scenarios, more the Conservative scenarios, this is RCP 8.5 is the worst case scenarios. Assuming the air temperature will increase a lot compared to the, the what we have here. And uh, this is a latest scenario. So this is a CM5, the previous version, and they converted this, this scenario into the new version. So the different name, but the same same context, so the same scenario. So RCP 4.5 is uh, kind of intermediate scenarios. Is, very widely used in climate change in studies, right? This is this corresponding to the SSP2. It's assuming the 
the world follows the path in which social, economic, and technology trends do not shift markedly from the historical path. This is very vague, so it has a lot of uncertainty. Anyway, RCP 8.5 corresponds to the worst case scenario. Anyway, so we, we decided to use these two intermediate and uh, extreme cases. There are many climate models available, and uh, this, this is a list of the climate model we could find, and uh, 29. And uh, they, uh, I mean, the different institute and the, the <laughs> across the world develop their own model. And uh, the problem is the climate model, they agree with each other on air temperature. The problem is they don't agree on the precipitation. Right, because precipitation is 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 it's a more complicated process than air temperature because it, it related to the, the what the wind and and the ocean current and and many different uh, the physiological processes. Right. So this and then because the climate model offers include the biases, bias even so, right? And then we need to collect the bias. We need to remove the bias. To do this, we need to compare the their output with our observations. So we identify the 35 climate like, weather stations associated with our modeling domain, and then we downscaled and collected the bias in the climate climate modeling output, so that we have uh, the climate modeling output can follow the, the can can represent the the how do I say characteristics? I mean the meteorological characteristics that we have in, in, in our area. And uh, this is a grid, and uh, this USGS model is a solving the governing equation is is in the form of a partial differentiation. Uh, anyway, so the, the model is using finite different method to solve the the, the complicated equation. So this is a uh, land use covers at the moment of 2014, I believe. We, thought, we assumed land cover does not change. It will not change in the future because we, we cannot <laughs> we cannot represent or the, consider the land use change, land cover changes because of the limitation of the model. And uh, this is a buffer line from the shoreline, five five kilometer taken with two thousand kilometers. <clears throat> to summarize the the model and output by the distance from the shoreline. Okay, climate projections. It's a uh, my data average precipitation over time. It's, it's future projections, right? From two thousand sixteen. So each each okay. This study present uh, what is it maximum. Precipitation projected by one of the climate models. This is minimum. So we have a lots of variations and uh, uncertainty bands, right? But if we take the average, we can see that the precipitation may change a lot over time, fluctuating a lot, right? But the overall, precipitation, precipitation may not increase. So it is increased, slowly increased at the rate of 3.9 millimeter per 10, 10 years. So I would say, Precipitation, precipitation or rainfall, I mean, total amount of annual rainfall may not change in the future. Temperature, maximum daily, minimum daily. And uh, it also has uh, some uncertainty, right? It's been a range between the maximum and minimum. Compared to the, the precipitation, it's uh, 2,500. Yeah, I have to believe, right? About 500. You can see, right? Climate models agree on the air temperature. It, it has, I mean, the amount of uncertainty is very, very, relatively small compared to precipitation. You can see air temperature, of course, it's a fluctuating over time, but uh, slowly increase. So, for example, by 2050, average, daily average temperature may increase by 1.5 to 1.8 degrees Celsius. This is what the, the climate model projected. <clears throat> and again, we employed the three different uh, serialized scenarios 
from well, liberal or optimistic to the, the conservative, right? So this is a baseline scenario. Black means we are assuming the current CMA daily variations, and then <laughs> IPCC median, no intermediate high, and no high. It's kind of congested here. Okay, reserve groundwater elevation. Okay, now this is a groundwater is a mean sea level, right? From the groundwater elevation in meters from the mean sea level, right? In the datum of a eight eight, right? Now we are here. No, now we are we are here about the point three or a point five meter from the mean sea level. And then by 2040 or 15, it's going to increase this much about uh, how much? Or 0.4. And at the end of this century, it's going to increase up to 1.6 or 7. This is one of the worst case scenarios. I do not want to. Okay, anyway. Groundwater is by land covers. This is a wet prairie. This is a north west of my data county. Right? So it's far from the shoreline. So groundwater level may not increase or decrease or whatever. It's not affected by the sea level rise. But here, for example, mangrove, right? It's, it's along the coastal shoreline. It's going to increase. And blue means it's so water. Water is it's not just the seawater. It's so classified as water, that especially the southeast or part of the uh, southeast corner of the Miami County. It's, uh, South of the, what is it? The, there is a nuclear plant. What is, what is the name of the term? Turkey, right. Yeah. right. It is wetland, right? So, for example, let's say the rock crop and the food and nursery greenhouse areas is in, in the middle of this, this is by the way, here, right? And by distance from, from shoreline, it's quite obvious, right? For example, 40 kilometers from the shoreline, this groundwater level or elevation will not be affected by sea level rise. But if you're close to the, the, the coastal line or the shoreline, it's going to increase a lot. Right? Here, the north, north of the Miami Dade County has a relatively higher groundwater elevation compared to the south. That's why it is maintained higher here. It does not mean it's, 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 it's kind of riskier than the south. But uh, you may want to look at the, the trend where the increase in the level of increase in the groundwater level from here. <clears throat> then seawater intrusion. Now <clears throat> we are here, right? About, uh, about 27% of Modeling domain. Modeling domain covers some part of Miami County and the south part of Broward County. But anyway, it does not mean all the, the dry inland affected by seawater. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of make sure this is about the modeling domain. So, modeling domain, 27%, I mean, how, how can I say, groundwater or aquifer under the 27% of modeling domain. Will be affected by the now is is under under influence of the sea level. No, is salt water is intruding up to this much, right? And then in the future, it's going to increase from twenty seven percent to about thirty five percent. How about uh, eight percent, right? Eight percent. I mean, the size of the area where the Okay. Size area to be affected by the social intrusion will be increased by 8% in the future. But interesting point is brackish water. Brackish water is uh, different from the seawater. It's between the fresh water and, and, and seawater, right? It has a selective concentration between 35, 35 per meal and 0.5, right? It's between about 22%, 2.2% uh, somewhere. So, size of areas to be affected by brackish water is decreasing. What does that mean? It's hard to understand, right? And then let me, let me explain this. This is current condition, baseline. Let's say we have a shoreline here, right? 
And so tomorrow into the this much, let's say, let's say three miles from the shoreline. And then there is a breakish water between fresh water and salt water, right? Always, always. And then breakish water further intrude by three miles from the this line, right? And in the future, seawater into this much from five miles from the shoreline. But breakish line, breakish water may intrude just by two meters. That's why the size of the area affected by blackish water may decrease in the future, but the salt water or total, total salt water interest may, may be increased. And which means there is a relatively sharp gradient of a salinity level from the fresh water to the, the, the seawater in the future. <laughs> so salinity level may quickly change from from our inland area to the, the ocean in the future. And okay, this is by land cover, right? And again, water and shoreline, the salt water already intruded a lot, so it doesn't matter, but problem is, let's say, low density urban areas, right? Because it's, it's and the oils, and the mangroves, the area close to the shoreline, be affected, more affected by the city life. Okay, and I I calculated the the difference between the groundwater level, the current groundwater level, and the project. I mean the groundwater level projected for the future. So here. Northwest or the west part of Miami County, groundwater elevation or the level may not change much. But if you come down to the southeast, in the chain, I mean, groundwater level and elevation may increase by about uh, 0.5 meters in the future, which is a lot compared, I mean, the way when we compare to the, the depth of soil we have, right? It's about the one meter or two meters, three meters in the, in the summer, right? So we are losing buffer for the, the flood. <clears throat> and we could calculate the probability of being intruded by salt water, including the breakage and seawater, right? So here, and uh, most of the areas is fine. It's, I, I was surprised why. <laughs> People complain about the, the increased salinity level, but uh, most of the areas is good, especially the, the black area, it's an agriculture area, right? And it's, it's fine, but uh, if you look at the southeast part, it's, there is a nuclear plant, and uh, we have a marsh, a salt, salt water marsh over here, right? It, this area will be fertile, and uh, subject to, to, to salt water into in the future. And uh, what, what, one of the interesting I, I found was there is a canal network along the coastline because the canal have rainwater percolating into the aquifer, it's gonna slow salt water into the processes. Of course, it's gonna increase groundwater level a lot, I mean, the relatively more compared to other areas, but still, it's gonna block or it's gonna slow the salt water getting into the, the aquifer. So, there is a trade off, right? So, salt water is salt water and the flooding. So we need to choose. <laughs> so anyway. So as I mentioned earlier, the, there are many different scenarios and uh, of course the, the model has its own the limitations and the problem, right? And then what I found is very, I mean, two different lines, right? So one is <coughs> one representing the <coughs> Worst case climate change scenario, the other one is, uh, is the best or the preferred climate change scenario, right? So climate change may not affect much. I may not affect future groundwater elevation or level. But problem is, sea rise scenario will dominate the, our future scenarios. So, and uh, Salt water into the production too, right? So 
depending on the what kind of a serialized scenario we select, we may have a different projections and uh, planning and the design for agriculture and infrastructures. So findings, and groundwater level was found much more sensitive to serialize than salt water intrusion processes. So this is uh, not what I expected, but uh, the, this is what the, the groundwater is saying. And the groundwater level and salt water intrusion area are much more responsive to serialized scenarios than climate change. So serialized is, is more critical to us. And the groundwater level in coastal areas are more sensitive to serialize than the land in high August, right? And the uh, uncertainty is, is, is quite severe. And again, the climate models with on increasing daily air temperature in the future. So it project, they project the daily air temperature increase by 1.5 degrees Celsius by 10, 2050, 2000, yeah, 2050. And uh, the fortunately, the modeling showed us agricultural land use or agriculture area may not be uh, so substantially affected by salt water into the processes, but groundwater level of agricultural area will increase a lot by 0.5 meter in the future. So we need to develop some measures to to how can I say save our crops and plants from the excess soil water or the high groundwater level in the future. And groundwater of the agriculture area will projected increase by <coughs> 4 meters by 2050 and 0.75 meters by 100 compared to baseline we have now. And the groundwater elevation expected to increase faster than some other land uses. Because we have some agricultural, agricultural areas located along the shoreline. So we may not want to grow plants there anymore. It's kind of elevation increase and salt water intrudes, so we have most problem in the area. Okay, so here, so recommendations: agricultural land use may experience <laughs> soil saturation more frequently in the future because increased groundwater level, and it's gonna affect crop productivity. So we need to come up with some creative measures and measurement practices for can mitigate the impacts. Okay. And uh, this is about the drainage area of Lake Okeechobee. It's north part of the Lake Okeechobee from the south of the Orlando to the outlet of the Kissimmee River Basin. Because this is the area creating and delivering the Excess nutrient to the lake and creating some some water quality issues, and we want to see how climate change may may affect the water quality issues we have now. So, two research questions: How close the water quality issues of the lake associated with the water and nutrient loadings from the Kissing River Basin? That is a drainage basin of uh, Lake Okeechobee. In other words, how global scale change like climate change may affect our local groundwater resources. How we can uh, cope with the, the plans to mitigate the plant and the, the impact. Again, Lake we are we are focusing on the Lake Okeechobee, and we consider the water quantity quality, and uh, we also. Uh, Consider the, the external factors like the inflow and rainfall air temperature. And one of the unique things we, we, we did was we were curious how internal hydrodynamic processes of a lake, rather than exter okay. external loading, is, is, uh, is the amount of nutrient and sediment coming from the, the outside of the lake, right? From Kissimmee River Basin, right? But the uh, lake is is a water body. is is keep moving, right? And the internal processes or the 
internal processes or the water current of the lake of Chobi may have some role in the water quality, right? So that's why we combined watershed loading model developed by USDA called the SWA, Solid and Water Assessment Tool, to the EFDC model uh, that can simulate the, the water body circulation in the in Okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hydro hydrodynamic processes happen in the in the lake, in the water body. So if this is uh, developed by the EPA, we combine these two, and uh, we calibrated the model to the observations made at the field because without calibration. Nobody will believe the, the modern results, right? So we found uh, some boundary conditions. So the, the green means the inlet of the lake, which means outlet of the watershed. So South Florida Water Management District is monitoring the, the flow and sediment and, and the nutrient. So we carry the model to the their observations. And then the the district also monitoring the water quality at many different places in the in the lake from one to nineteen. So we can get the model to the to the <coughs> in water observations. Anyway, this is a calibration result. I want to show the, how <coughs> accurately the model can predict the, the all the variables, water levels, and uh, red means. Red represent observation, the black represent the simulator or predicting. It's, it's I mean, the simulation, simulated hardware follow the observations. <coughs> and yeah. uh, what is this one? It's water temperature, water level, or water depth, chlorophy A concentration, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, and uh, dissolved oxygen. It has some errors, but overall, uh, we found that. Uh, model could provide acceptable accuracy in, in predicting those variables. And uh, this is some statistical analysis. And uh, what we found is wind speed may be more critical. Mm -hmm. is, is affecting the water quality processes compared to the external loading. This is another surprising, right? Mm -hmm. We have a lot, I mean, Florida spent lots of money to reduce the nutrient loading. I mean, the what is called is uh, Everglade the restoration plan. We, we have yeah. lots of BMAP plans happening in the, the Kissing River Basin, right? But wind speed is, is affecting the water quality more than the external loading. This is uh, surprising. And uh, let me explain the Y in the mechanism, right? So X axis represents the wind speed, or X, this Y axis is uh, horizontal, the speed of water current, right? And Second exit, y axis is uh, daily average clock A. When wind speed increase, speed of speed of water current also increase. That's obvious, right? But at the same time, clock A decrease. And and why? What what happened here? This is mechanical. When wind speed increase, bottom shear stress increase also. Because it's, it's shear stress is, is kind of a force that the, how the lifting lifting up the soil particle from the bottom, right? And then sediment deposited at the, at the bottom will be resuspended into the water column, right? And then it's gonna increase turbidity, it's gonna reduce light intensity, and then it's gonna increase de I'm sorry, decrease photosynthesis, and then as it may reduce. For example, let me show you the, some 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 evidence. <clears throat> okay, this is observation. This is not really, this does not include any model. Okay, wind speed at y axis is time, right? Let's say wind, when wind speed is relatively low, we have a relatively high clock A concentration, right? When wind speed goes up, it's going to drop a lot. Okay, here, right? It's same pair, and same pair, and same pair. 
it, for example, in the case of hurricane, I forgot the name of the hurricane we had in 2017. Right after hurricane, probably a concentration has reduced a lot because it's, it mixed the, all, all the water and the sediment together and then decreased the light intensity in testing and then probably. So climate, climate change may, may change the amount of water and nutrient coming into the lake from the Kissing River Basin. Here, these three watershed are highly controlled by district. It has a lot of uh, connected systems, and uh, our model could not accurately predict mutant loading okay? because it's controlled by this uh, human being, right? <clears throat> it's hard to predict. And so we focus on these three big watersheds. These big watersheds, their boundaries can be delineated by topography naturally. And they also have a clear networks, but it's highly many for the operating by district. That's why the model could provide the accurate prediction. Anyway, so I know you know time. So temperature in the future increase. And then rainfall does not change much. And one thing is flow increase and total nitrogen and phosphorus also increase, especially the total phosphorus increase. One of the assumptions we made in the modeling was current fertilizer application practices, like including weight and timing, does not change, will not change in the future, right? So that was the assumption we made. And then the fertilizer application will looks like contributing to increase increasing the total for source loading to the lake. Okay, let's skip. And then we also want to see the how the lack of Shobi water lack of Shobi water level operation can affect water quality issues. And we, we incorporate the three different uh, scenarios maintaining high water just middle water or average water and lower. It's quite obvious, right? Total phosphorus and nitrogen concentration will be high, relatively high, when the water level maintained low. Because amount of water is, is, is smaller, right, than others, and then concentration may increase. But, but water level operation does not change dissolved the oxygen. Does that change the flow A? <clears throat> so conclusions and okay, modern calibrated the impact of wind speed that drives the internal hydrodynamic processes on LG biomass was greater than the external loading. It's loading from the Kissing River Basin. That is one finding. And the other one is okay, flow and the total. Uh, suspended solid may decrease in the future, but total phosphorus load may increase when assuming current fertilization practice just will not change, right? If, if the practice does not change in the future. Okay, and then the water quality of Lake Chubby may be degraded in the future because of increase in air temperature, right? air temperatures affect the, the due to the cycle of the lake and uh, still the external loading may, may increase in the future. And water level operation may reduce the, the total phosphorus and nitrogen concentration if we maintain high water level, but it did a little to the chlorine A and the dissolved oxygen. Okay, and then the final is uh, chlorine A and the uh, dissolved oxygen may be more sensitive to climate forcing, climate change, but the uh, TN phosphorus and nitrogen concentration is sensitive to responsible to external loading. 
and their suggestions. And water level operation may reduce the nutrient level, but may not help mitigate the algal blooms. And then the, the finding demonstrates that water quality lake was a function of air temperature, internal hydrodynamics, not just as well as external loading. So we may want to look at the, the internal, internal hydrodynamics <laughs> rather than just focusing on the, the nutrient loading reductions, spending lots of time I and mean, the money and time in the restoration plan. Okay, this this 